Hi, welcome back to Reading with Manny. Today it's gonna be a bit of a different kind of video because one, I'm speaking in English, I am not showing you my journal because that's where I keep it, you know, uh, calm and relaxing and I just talk a little bit about the books that I've read. Today is not that day, today is going to be me ranting about books and when I do that the English tends to, tends to just come out anyway, even if I was trying to speak in Spanish, so here we are. Prepare yourselves for my disjointed, chaotic thoughts about the books I love. Anyway, um, so I'm going to be talking today about my favorites of the year so far, uh, especially the last ones. Um, so yeah, let's get started. The first book is actually the last one I read, but I have read it before actually. Like this is not a new book to me, it's a reread, but the thing is that um, the one I read was borrowed from a friend, so I needed to have the physical copy. And finally this year I decided to buy it and when it arrived I was like, yeah, I have to read it again, like, come on. So yes, look at it, it's very pretty. It's called If We Were Villains by Emma Rio. Now, this book, um, I, I don't even know how to start with this, so I'm just going to read to you the synopsis because I'm sure that if you know me at all, you will understand why I love this book so much. Enter the players. There were seven of us then, seven bright young things with wide, precious futures ahead of us. Until that year, we saw no further than the books in front of our faces. On the day Oliver Marks is released from jail, the man who put him there is waiting at the door. Detective Colborn wants to know the truth, and after ten years, Oliver is finally ready to tell it. A decade ago, Oliver is one of seven young Shakespearean actors at Delisher Classical Conservatory, a place of keen ambition and fierce competition. In this secluded world of firelight and leather-bound books, Oliver and his friends play the same roles on stage and off. Hero, villain, tyrant, temptress, ingenue, extra. But in their fourth and final year, good nature rivalries turn ugly, and on opening night, real violence invades the students' world of make-believe. In the morning, the fourth years find themselves facing their very own tragedy, and their greatest acting challenge yet, convincing the police each other and themselves that they are innocent. <laughs> Alright, so this book has all the dark academia vibes you could possibly want. Um, and what the synopsis doesn't tell you is how obsessed, like really, to what level they are obsessed with Shakespeare. The characters speak in Shakespeare quotes constantly, like seriously all the time, which honestly something to aspire to. So I am in awe, like seriously, in awe of the author and the amount of work and study she must have put into this because the quotes fit, everything fits so perfectly and the plays, even the plays that they are supposed to represent in the, at the school, they really end up being so symbolic of their, their own characters and their own relationships and it really brings those dynamics to life and they're just so well chosen, it's just amazing. So yes, interesting things about this book then, obviously, the Shakespeare, the relationships between the characters, which are really complicated, the thriller element, obviously, and yeah, it's also heartbreaking, which is something that apparently I love. I love books that break my heart. <laughs> so yes, final recommendation, uh, the Shakespeare might be a bit of putting if you're not used to it, but the plot is so fast-paced that really, like, it's impossible to get bored and you can just breeze through it it's not that long either so oh, give it a try love it all right now second book um is called station 11 by emily st john mandel now again this is another book that i don't really know how to explain <laughs> um so again i'm just going to read to you the synopsis Kirsten Raymond will never forget the night Arthur Leander, the famous Hollywood actor, had a heart attack on stage during a production of King Lear. That was also the night when a devastating flu pandemic arrived in the city, and within weeks, civilization as we know it came to an end. Twenty years later, Kirsten moves between the settlements of the altered world with a small troupe of actors and musicians. They call themselves the Traveling Symphony, and they have dedicated themselves to keeping the remnants of art and humanity alive. But when they arrive in St. Deborah by the water, they encounter a violent prophet who will threaten the tiny band's existence. And as the story takes off, moving back and forth in time and vividly depicting life before and after the pandemic, 
the strange twist of fate that connects them all will be re revealed. The writing in this book is phenomenal. Like, it's it's poetic. It's very character based, I would say, because there's not much plot to it. I mean, there is plot because you want to know how all the stories connect, but it doesn't really have like um yeah like an ending that you're supposed to get to obviously yes the stories of the different characters start like converging that's a thing i really enjoy in books as like non-linear narration which which this has because it goes back and forth in time before and after the pandemic um and yeah i just i just adore this book um the ending is is very hopeful which i think we all need uh, especially, you know, during a pandemic. And yes, I found it funny that this book mentions King Lear and that one also mentions King Lear. It actually made me want to reread King Lear, which I haven't read in a while. So yes, um, definitely recommend this one. This woman is a genius. And also she wrote a companion book, which is The Glass Hotel. Now this is not a sequel, it's a companion. Um, I won't say much about it because if you're planning to read either of this, which I do recommend, you know, that you read together. I don't want to say how or why it's a companion and not a sequel. So yes, not gonna spoil anything. Pick them up. Uh, she's amazing. Definitely a new favorite author of mine. Um, and she has a book coming out soon too. So very excited for that. All right, next book. Um, this one is actually the one that I read a few months ago now, like, what was it, April, something like that. Um, I absolutely love this book. I devoured it. As you can see, it's quite short. It's called The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. Now, this book deals with some, you know, delicate issues like, trigger warning here, uh, suicide, yes, um, depression, those kind of things. Um, but I found it to be, again, very hopeful. Uh, the ending is, in particular, it really reminded me of um, I don't know, there, there's a lot of messages about living life to the fullest and trying to find your happiness and yeah, all of that. I'm just gonna read to you what's about. Nora's life has been going from bad to worse. Then at the stroke of midnight on her last day on earth, she finds herself transported to a library. There she is given the chance to undo her regrets and try out each of the other lives she might have lived. Which raises the ultimate question, with infinite choices, what is the best way to live? So yeah, this book is amazing. Nora arrives at this library and from each book, she can pick a different book and go see the life that she would have had if she had made a different choice in her life. And so yeah, you see her jumping from life to life, trying to find happiness. I'm not gonna spoil the ending, but yeah, if you want a feel good book, I mean, I did cry <laughs> several times, I cry a lot. Um, but yes, I remember the moment of reading it. We had just gone back into virtual learning and I was extremely tired and, you know, just reliving last year basically and seeing no end to it. And yeah, it was nice to read a short, sweet, hopeful book that really reminded me of how wonderful it is to be alive in this world sometimes, I guess, and that we can uh, get through this. So yeah. I should stop talking about the pandemic. But. All right, so next book, and I lied, I'm not going to stop talking about the pandemic, is called The Anthropocene Reviewed by John Green. Now, I don't have a physical copy of that book because I lent it to a friend, so I'll just show a picture of the book somewhere. Um, so The Anthropocene Reviewed is the one non-fiction book I have read this year. I don't tend to read um, non-fiction, I gravitate towards fiction. I should stop saying the word fiction. But anyway, this book is just amazing. Uh, the Anthropocene refers to this period of our planet in which all the events and all the changes and everything is being created for and by humans. That's why Anthro, man. You know. In this book, uh, John Green just reviews different elements and human experiences from his favorite drink to uh, humanity's temporal range or you know grass <laughs> I know it sounds I'm not selling this book well but every essay every review is just so poignant 
and emotional and it really makes you feel connected to humanity. Uh, he wrote it during the pandemic and I think it was the perfect book for when it came out um, and for that period of our lives and I think it's still very relevant. John Green is just an amazing writer. Um, so yeah, I don't really have much to say except go read it. Again, it's not a very long book. The essays are short and to the point and they Again, they really made me feel, I teared up a lot, like every couple of pages I was tearing up. <laughs> I do have a problem. Um, but yes, this book is just fantastic. I would reread it every year. Like, I might, I might even do that. Or at least my favorite ones. Um, the one of the Humanities Temporal Range was my favorite one. I read that one on Instagram. If you want to go check it out, I'll maybe link that. The next book I have for you is also one that I don't have physically yet, so picture somewhere. It's called Piranesi by Susanna Clark. Again, I could not describe to you what this book is about. I might be bad at describing what books are about. Seriously, it's just such a wacky, insane book. So I'm just gonna read to you the synopsis. Piranesi's house is no ordinary building. Its rooms are infinite, its corridors endless. Its walls are lined with thousands upon thousands of statues, each one different from all the others. Within the labyrinth of halls, an ocean is imprisoned. Waves thunder up staircases, rooms are flooded in an instant. But Piranesi is not afraid. He understands the tides as he understands the pattern of the labyrinth itself. He lives to explore the house. There is one other person in the house, a man called The Other, who visits Piranesi twice a week and asks for help with research into a great and secret knowledge. But as Piranesi explores, evidence emerges of another person and a terrible truth begins to unravel, revealing a world beyond the one Piranesi has always known. I cannot describe this book, seriously. The only thing I can say, apart from that crazy synopsis, is that Piranesi is the purest character I have read in a while, like, I love him with all my soul. Um, and again, it has a very hopeful ending, so it was a nice, nice read. A short one too, it's not a very long book either. So, yeah, definitely, definitely recommend this if you're into strange books. Um, that at the beginning you don't quite know what is happening, but then you start piecing things together. That's also something I love uh, in books, so yeah definitely recommend Piranesi. All right, next up, last one that I have digitally, so picture somewhere, uh, is called The Binding by Bridget Collins. And this book is just unique. I don't know, I found it um, like a really cool premise, which again, I'm just gonna read to you. Books are dangerous things in Collins' alternate universe, a place vaguely reminiscent of 19th century England. It's a world in which people visit bookbinders to rid themselves of painful and treacherous memories. Once their stories have been told and are bound between the pages of a book, the slate is wiped clean and their memories lose the power to hurt or haunt them. Already, I read that and I was hooked. After having suffered some sort of mental collapse and no longer able to keep up with his farm chores, Emmett Farmer is sent to the workshop of one such binder to live and work as her apprentice. Leaving behind home and family, Emmett slowly regains his health while learning the binding trade. He is forbidden to enter the locked room where books are stored, so he spends many months marbling end pages, tooling leather book covers and gilding edges. But his curiosity is piqued by the people who come and go from the inner sanctum, and the arrival of the lordly Lucian Darnay, with whom he senses a connection, changes everything. So. Um, I want to learn how to bind books now after reading this book. It was just, the first part is just uh, a love poem to books, which I love. The story is told the first part where you don't really know what's going on because Emmett doesn't know, he doesn't really remember what happened to him. Um, so you don't know what's going on. Then you have a flashback kind of thing, so you go to the past. And then, well, you have the rest of the story in the third part. Love that. Amazing. So yes, definitely recommend this book. Um, very unique, very readable, and with great relationships between the characters. So always a good thing. All right, now the last two books are definitely 
the most like if I had to choose between these two I don't know what I would choose first up we have The Kingdoms by Natasha Pulley now Natasha Pulley is definitely one of my favorite authors of all time by this point although I discovered her three years ago maybe I don't know I love every single book she has um, she has three other books which I will talk about in a separate video because I need to make a video about Natasha Pulley alone but yes, this was her uh, her fourth book, which was released this year, and it was the most anticipated thing. Like, I was waiting for this book to come out, and when I finally got it in my hands, I could not believe it. It's just, look at it, it's so pretty. Anyway, I'm going to read to you what it's about, and then I'll talk a bit more about it. Um, there's not, yeah, I can't really say much about it because I would spoil everything, but come home if you remember. The postcard has been held at the sorting office for 91 years, waiting to be delivered to Joe Tournier. On the front is a lighthouse, Aylan Moor in the Outer Hebrides. Joe has never left England, never even left London. He is a British slave, one of thousands throughout the French Empire. He has a job, a wife, a baby daughter. But he also has flashes of a life he cannot remember and of a world that never existed, a world where English is spoken in England and not French. And now he has a postcard of a lighthouse built just six months ago that was first written nearly 100 years ago by a stranger who seems to know him very well. Joe's journey to unravel the truth will take him from French-occupied London to a remote Scottish island and back through time itself as he battles for his life and for a very different future. I cannot tell you how much I love this book. It has everything I love. Like it's historical fiction, like speculative historical fiction. There's time traveling. There's amazing characters. Um, I just, I, I can't, I can't with this book. Again, non-linear narration. It goes back and forth, different points of view. It's just, <laughs> and when you start piecing everything together and trust me, this book does not disappoint. I said it was like my most anticipated read and it did not let me down. Like all the this pieces start slotting together and you can tell where it's going, but you no, don't know if you want it. I, I can't explain it, this book. I can't, like I finished it and I literally, like I sat there and I had to physically stop myself from opening it again and starting it again. Like, I can't, I want to reread it, but I have other things I want to read, I don't have time. But yes, I just had to sit there with the book like held to my chest like this because it's precious. It's really precious. I just, and let me tell you, Kite is my favorite character, like from all the books I've read recently. I know I just said that about Piranesi, but Kite, <laughs> Kite. Anyway, I'm gonna stop ranting about this book. Expect a Natasha Pulli book, a video because I love her. And finally, last book for today. The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. I don't know what my cat is doing back there. This book, again, I could not choose. If you, had to, if you made me choose between the kingdoms and this one, I, I don't know. I don't know which one I love the most. So I'm just going to read to you again what this book is about. Are you lost or are you exploring? When Zachary Rollins stumbles across a mysterious library book containing details from his own life among its pages, it leads him on a quest unlike any other. I mean, already. Following the clues inside, he is guided to a masquerade party, a dangerous secret club, and finally to a labyrinth filled with stories hidden far beneath the surface of the earth. Like, did this woman write this book for me, like, specifically? My god. But when the labyrinth is threatened, Zachary must race through its twisting tunnels and crowded ballrooms, searching for the end of his story. Like, seriously, I do feel like this book was written for me, personally. I don't know. It's just a book, it's a story about stories and how they shape us and how they keep us alive and we keep the stories alive by telling them. I don't know. I don't know how to explain this book. I just know that I finished it and I was very happy I read it. It reminded me of, I mean, not that I need reminding because I've always loved reading, but um, it really captures why I love reading. Um, the stories and how humans are capable of creating these stories. I, I don't know. So this book doesn't have again, like the others I've just mentioned, uh, doesn't have like a linear narration. I mean, yes, there is the main plot, but then there's 
other stories interspersed and you are constantly trying to see how they relate and how they might affect each other and I don't know it's just fantastic amazing book um if I had to recommend one especially if you you know you don't know what to read or like you're in a reading slump or something like that this is the book to pick up so there you go uh that is my very small collection of favorite books so far I have read 29 books by the end of August so I am very excited to see uh the next four months of reading and where they take me and when it comes to the day where I have to choose a favorite book of the year I don't know what I'm going to do anyway I hope you like this video if you want to see more from me like either these ranty disjointed chaotic videos or my more relaxed journaling videos about reading um, you should subscribe to my channel because uh, yeah I will be posting those as soon as my very busy time uh, table lets me I am a teacher so there is not a lot of downtime. The usual things, like this video, leave a comment, let me know if I have inspired you to pick up any of these books or if you have read them, which one was your favorite. And with that said, I think that's it. I'll see you in my next one. Bye, happy reading.